week. And that is, we have every uh, Motzei Shabbat. Are you, are you all familiar with that term, Motzei Shabbat? Mm -hmm. Motzei is going out, Shabbat, you know, the Sabbath. So every Saturday night, we have a study meeting in our study center in Jerusalem, or in uh, Ashdod. I don't know why I said Jerusalem. In Ashdod. And many of the people who come to that are, are leaders of other ministries. And there was a couple there going to, where are they going to? Um, Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. And there is some, within the believing community there, there's some hostility towards Israel. So he's going to be sharing and teaching while he's there concerning why Israel is important. So I thought since we're together, you've come to Israel, I realized that, that you all believe that Israel is important and that there is a place for Israel and God's end times plan. But I thought it would be good to look at a portion of scripture. So for those of you who have your Bibles or today, of course, we all have uh, phones and such you can go to. But I would encourage you to open up your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah in chapter 30. Now, Jeremiah, for me, is one of the most unique prophets. Let me ask you a question. How many days did Jeremiah prophesy? Let me ask you maybe this way. How many years did Jeremiah prophesy? Sometimes we, we think that he came and he spent a week or maybe a couple weeks and shared. He prophesied over 40 years. And he had, for the most part, the same message. And as he prophesied, there was all these other prophets who said that he was the false prophet. When we know that he was the true prophet of God. And no one wanted to hear what he had to say. Now, that's tragic because they needed to hear. God gave much opportunity for the people to repent. He wanted them to repent. He encouraged them to repent. He told them exactly what to do, but no one would listen. And then you come to a very unique chapter where God says to Jeremiah, no longer pray for these people. Because there is no opportunity now for repentance. The judgment is coming. But when we come to the chapter that we studied this past Saturday night, chapter 30, we see that there is some great news in this chapter. So let's begin. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 1. The word which was to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying... Now that's emphasized because no one else was hearing from the Lord. All those other prophets, they were telling the people what they wanted them to believe, what the people wanted to hear. Only Jeremiah was speaking the truth. Now earlier, the text will tell us other places in Jeremiah that God was faithful to raise up other prophets that he sent forth and they would do something. They would get up early. Now, Hebrew is a wonderful language. Moran was sharing that you have a wake-up call. Hashkamah is Hebrew for a wake-up call. And it's the same word that's used in the book of Jeremiah for the prophets getting up early in order to tell the people what to do. So we see here that Jeremiah heard from the Lord, and it says in verse 2, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, I would challenge you to do something. Go through the Bible, and when you come across this term, the God of Israel, you can almost always anticipate something good is going to happen. Whenever we see the term, the God of Israel, it speaks about a God who is going to keep his covenantal promises. So it's not surprising here that we have good news says in the last part of verse 2, write for yourself. Meaning, Jeremiah has not enjoyed hearing these difficult words. These words of war. These words of famine. These words of pestilence. He hasn't liked giving that to the people. So he says now, write for yourself 
all these things which I have spoken to you. And then it says, in a book. Now that's unique. Because most of the time, he was just simply speaking. He sent letters far away to those who were already in exile. But here it's unique, write it in a book. Now let me ask you a question. Why do you think God told Jeremiah to write this down in a book? Not the whole prophecy that we have right now, but just these words that he was saying in this chapter. Why do you think he said, write this down? Any ideas? To preserve them. Okay, preserve them. I would agree with you, Gary. Why do you think there's a need for them to be preserved? Any ideas? They're important. Because they're important and cold. So um, people know it's from God, because God's word always comes true. It comes true, and specifically, what's unique about this prophecy is that so frequently what Jeremiah was saying was for his time, his day. It was going to happen very soon. But what we're going to see in Jeremiah chapter 30 was not for the days of Jeremiah. So what Gary said, write this down because it needs to be preserved because, well, let me say it this way. We're still waiting for this to take place. It hasn't happened. So God hasn't forgotten it. The problem is oftentimes the church forgets it or ignores it or wants to interpret it in a way that is not at all in line with what the Word of God is saying. Look now to verse 3. For behold, the days are coming. So this also helps us to understand this is a future prophecy. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. And again, as you study the scripture more and more, you'll find that terms repeat over and over. And the reason for this repetition is these terms have meaning. And when you look at the context that they come to us within, we know that this phrase, declares the Lord, is a term of promise. God's promising to do something, and here again, in the future, and there's my favorite word, behold. Why behold? Pay attention because this has great significance. Now, I mentioned this phrase, Nehum Hashem declares the Lord, is a promise. We don't have to read too much further, do we, until we see what that promise is. He's going to tell us exactly. He says, middle of verse 3, And I will bring back, that is the word to restore or to return, the captivity of my people. And then, this next two words are so important. The captivity of my people, and then the two <coughs> words are Israel and Judah. Why does that stand out? Why would that be so important? Those two names, Israel and Judah. Any ideas? <coughs> they had been separated. Okay, there was that divided kingdom. That's true. So it anticipates a regathering of both. But also we know something. We know that Israel, that northern kingdom, was no more. They had gone into a different exile. Now, we know in Jeremiah's day, he was talking about the Babylonian captivity. But before the Babylonian captivity, there was the Assyrian one. And they never came back. And to this day, for the most part, it's never come back. This is something that is a last day promise that God, and we see that, for example, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, we are told that that's going to happen. This regathering of both Israel and Judah. So the rabbinical scholars say this. When we're speaking about Israel and Judah, that demands a last day context. Then it says, I will return them. Now, the key thing is them. Who's the them? Well, Israel and Judah. But do you know how much of Christianity interprets this? In fact, not too long ago, I was at a meeting in, in another place in Europe, and they were talking about this very scripture, 
And they said that the then there are the Arab people who are coming to faith. But this is not the context. But it's to justify their theology. Very dangerous. I'm thankful for Arab people who come to faith. God loves them just as much as the Jewish people. But the promise of the land is uniquely to the children of Israel, the sons of Jacob. So he says, I will return them to the land. Not just any land, but the land, the land which I have given to their fathers, and they will inherit it. It speaks about an inheritance. Now, as I look at that word in Hebrew here, it is the word where the term or the name Jerusalem comes from. So we need to remember we're going there for this coming Shabbat. Hope you're excited about that. That you will be for this next Shabbat in Jerusalem, a place that speaks about an inheritance, an inheritance of the will of God, the purposes of God, the plans of God. Look now to verse 4. These things which the Lord has spoken to Israel and to Judah. If we missed it in the previous verse, it's emphasized here. This promise of Israel and Judah <coughs> being brought back together and experience the same outcome. And that outcome, we're speaking about the last days, is a kingdom outcome. Verse 5. <coughs> For thus said the Lord, the sound or the voice of, of fear. Now, this is the word harada, and in, in modern Hebrew, this speaks, we have some people who are nurses and doctors in the medical field. This is the modern Hebrew word for going into shock. So something happens that, that scares you so much, there's a, a physical outcome of that. Your body does not function normally. So it says here, the voice of fear we have heard. And then it uses another word for fear. And then it says, there is no peace. Now, what this scripture tells us is that before the kingdom comes, there's going to be a time where there's not going to be peace. How do the rabbis interpret this? That we look at the world and we can even look more importantly to Israel and the Jewish people. And we're not going to see them in any way connected to the will of God. There is going to be a great, the Hebrew word par, a great, a great division, a great separation, a great distance between God's will for the land and the people and what we see in reality. This is going to precede the fulfillment of God's will. So we're going to look at something and we don't see God's will and there's any way that it's going to be fulfilled and then God's going to bring about a very dramatic change. Verse 6. Ask please, and that's literally the word, meaning this is significant. You need to pay attention to this question and look, meaning perceive something. And he asks a question which is ridiculous. If a male can give birth. Uh. Now, we're just going to put that aside. I know what you're all thinking about. We'll just drop that. If a male gives birth. Now, the answer, obviously, is what? No. no. Then there's a second question. If that's the case, and we know it is, then why do I see every male his hand upon his loins, meaning upon his waist. And this is an image of, of labor pains. So if males don't give birth, then why are they suffering like a woman who is giving birth? And then we see that all their faces have turned to, and if you do have a Bible, you're following along, it'd be of interest to me. All the faces turn what? Yeah. Yeah. Pale. Now, this is a great example of the translator 
not at all paying attention to the language. But we say today, right, you know, uh, you don't look so good. You're kind of green. pale. But literally the color is what? Green. green. Now, I like cartoons. You would be surprised how I still watch, thank goodness for YouTube, there's all these good old cartoons. And when someone used to get sick, they would turn green. And this is the color that's mentioned there. And by the way, what's interesting is this. When you talk about the seals, we see that there is, in the book of Revelation, there is that first seal. It's white. And then it's red. And then it's black. And then it's not pale or dabbled, as some Bibles say. But it's literally that same word for green. And if you were to ask the, the rabbinical commentators, why green? Well, we think maybe of sickness, and that may be okay, but, but what is being emphasized from this culture is pain and suffering. So if you're sick, it's going to be sick from great pain and suffering. That is what's going to happen. Now, let me see if you've been paying attention. The last thing I said before talking about the faces of these men, I said that there was going to be a time when we look at Israel and the Jewish people and they seem very far away from what? God's will. God's will. Now we see in the same verse, but a little bit further along, everyone is suffering intense pain. What do we learn from that? When you're not in God's will, get prepared to what? Suffer. When you say no to God's will, what you're saying is, I can take some more pain. Give, give, give me pain. That's the message that the scriptures give me. And then he says, look at verse 7. Now, verse 7 is one of the most well-known verses among Israelis and Jewish people in general. Not for the beginning, but for the end. What does it say? Well, how does your Bible translate that first word? What's the first word in verse 7? Alas. Alas. Okay, I think some Bibles say, whoa. It is a word of, of something that's not good. And if there's not a change, how awful it's going to be. Now, in, in some English Bibles, they have that word, whoa. And I always think about, you know, a horse going, galloping fastly, coming to the end of a cliff. And anyone's going to say to that horse, what would you say, Gary? Whoa. Whoa, exactly. And if that horse doesn't, whoa, how awful. That's the meaning here. It calls for a urgent change. And then it says, for great is that day. And the greatness here is not in a positive way, but great in a horrible way. In fact, it says, in regard to the severity of that day, there's never been one like it. And we know that, that Messiah speaks some very similar words about the end times and how it is going to be the worst time of suffering ever, unfortunately, for the Jewish people. And then it tells us, look at the second half of verse 7. A time of trouble. A time of trouble for Jacob. Jacob here referring to Israel, the Jewish people. Now, by the way, let me give you a verse. Look sometime at Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. We have that same term here for a time of trouble. It also appears here. It's the worst time of suffering ever. For, for Israel. So why would we think about that verse? Well, notice how the verse ends. But out of it, or from all of this pain, from all of this suffering, what's going to be the outcome? Salvation. Salvation. So yes, we suffer, and I've oftentimes been asked the question, you know, why would God allow Israel to go through so much suffering in the end? Well, the reason is, to bring that remnant to repentance, to bring that remnant to salvation. Verse 8. And it will come about on that day. Now, hopefully you're familiar with that term. 
I mention it frequently. That day is a judgment day. And God is going to bring judgment upon the enemy. We'll see this. And in bringing that judgment upon the enemy, and who's the enemy? Well, if you believe Zechariah, and I certainly do, all the nations in the world, all the nations, none will be excluded. Now, that doesn't mean every individual, but every nation is going to choose to go against the purposes of God. It will come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, there's that term of promise, that He's going to do something. I will break the yoke upon your neck. Now, remember something. If you know the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah gave a prophecy. He told the people to do something, to take these metal poles and put them upon their neck. He did that because he says, you're going into exile and you're going to be in bondage. But that was not forever. It was not to destroy the people. God was going to do that for 70 years and then there was going to be an end. Well, this is talking about another end of suffering. He says, I will break the yoke from upon your neck and the, the cords, your cords, I am going to snap off. Now, in modern Hebrew, it's the same word for disconnecting your phone. I am going to make a disconnection of all of this. And you will not look at the middle and or the end of verse 8. And they no longer, speaking of Israel, the Jewish people, they will no longer anymore. What does your Bible say? What won't they do anymore? They won't serve who? Some Bibles will say foreigners. It's the word zarim. Now, the reason why that may be familiar to some of you, if you follow along in the weekly Torah portion, in the Torah portion called Shemini, we know that, that the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, what did they do? Strange fire. Or a foreign fire. Same Hebrew word. And this, most people believe, and it's interpreted two ways by most authorities. One is, they are no longer going to serve foreigners, and what they mean by that is foreign gods, alien idols. <coughs> the second way it's interpreted is they're no longer going to serve foreign authority, meaning that Israel's not going to be under the, the authority of others. And we know from the, the prophet Isaiah that one day that mountain of, of Jerusalem is going to be established as the chief mountain. That's where the government of God is going to come from. And notice when this, this change happens, it's going to bring about a change in Israel. Look at verse 9. And they will serve, and I would suggest to you that this word for serving has to do with worship. In fact, most of the scholars agree. They will worship the Lord their God. That's good. But notice the next thing it says. Who else are they going to worship? It says David, their king. And of course, we're not talking about David, the son of Jesse. But rather when David is mentioned after his death, we're talking about the son of David. It is a, a term, David, for the beloved one of God or Messiah. And then notice what it says at the end of this verse, whom I will raise up. I believe that's a reference to the resurrection. I will raise up for them. They're going to look upon the one who has been pierced and they're going to see that he is not dead, but he is alive. Verse 10. And you in the scene, you do not fear my servant Jacob. Again, the commentators say, why? We're talking about Jacob. We're not talking about the man, but we're talking about Israel, the people. Why is it singular? Because every person has to make a decision of faith for themselves. Do not fear, my servant Jacob, declares the Lord. Do not be confused, O Israel. For behold, I am saving you from the distance. 
and your seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob will dwell in quietness and in rest. And there will no longer be anyone to make him afraid. Verse 11, and this will be our last verse. For I am with you. Now, let me ask you a question. I would really highlight that term when God says, I'm with you. I make a big deal out of the word with. Why is that? Anyone remember? Because with is a word that relates to redemption. The only way that we can be with God, the only way that He can be with us is through redemption. And that's why I've shared with you that the name Emmanuel means with us God is, from a rabbinical standpoint, the redemptive name of Messiah. So he says, Behold, or verse 11, For I will be with you, declares the Lord. This promise, I believe it's a promise of a last day redemption. To save you, for I will make an end Chala, not chala, the bread, but a different word, which means to bring to a complete sensation, an ending of, a stopping. Behold, I will bring to an end all the nations where I have scattered you there. So all those nations, but you, notice the difference, but you, I will not make and end. He says, I will discipline you, that is, I will place upon you judgment, but I will not, I will not here leave you undone, meaning I'm going to punish you, but you're not going to come to an end. This punishment is not for the purpose of destruction. Now we'll stop there, but I would encourage you read the last part of this chapter, the second half. Again, God shows that He is going to put His judgment upon the nations, and here the nations are those that are against His purposes, His plans, against His redemptive outcome. And one of the things you're going to see as you read the conclusion of this 30th chapter of Jeremiah is that there's going to be that, that familiar expression that appears throughout the Bible. It begins early on in the Scripture, we see it also in the very last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, where he says, And I will be your God, and you will be my people. That is, according again to the rabbinical perspective, that is a sentence that relates to redemption. The only way that we can be as people, no matter who you are, the only way is through redemption, that we become His people and God becomes our God. It's only possible through redemption. So one of the things I'll share with you is this. As we go and begin tomorrow and make our way from here going to Caesarea and then to Mount Carmel and then to Megiddo, we're going to see how important that concept of redemption is. And so I'll conclude with that tonight. We have about 15 minutes if there's any comments, if people need to go back up to their rooms and stuff, because dinner is about 7 o'clock, so we have a few minutes left. Any comments, any questions that maybe you thought about during the time I was speaking that you want to ask about the tour? Rifka, yeah, okay, yeah. Peter. Any, and two questions, anything public announcing on state of health? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. On my health. On your health, on Rifka's health. Yeah. Well. Uh, let me just share, I appreciate Peter mentioning it. Many of you may not know, but uh, the day before Passover, uh, Rivka went to the...